quintessential phenom. We'll speak with him 30 years after he made his big league debut today on Outside the Lines. Sunday, June 22nd, 2003. Please welcome David Clark. 30 years ago, just three weeks after his high school prom, he was pitching in the majors. David Clyde was so far above Roger Clemens when he was 18 years old that you can't even, it's like comparing apples and oranges. But his rare talent was squandered by a team eager to cash in. David was a victim. It was probably the worst ball club I could have signed with. And as he struggled to live up to the hype, his critics pounced. Five no hitters. No hitters. I like to see them girls he played against. I lived a dream. As I said, it turned into a nightmare. Today on Outside the Lines, the flight of the phenom, the story of David Clyde. Outside the Lines is presented by State Farm Insurance. And now your host, Jeremy Schapp. 30 years ago this week, in the early summer of 1973, David Clyde made the gigantic leap from high school to the major leagues as an 18-year-old starting pitcher for the Texas Rangers. It's a bittersweet anniversary for a man who spent only five seasons in the big leagues, a man who during his short career endured two failed marriages, two arm operations, as well as a greedy owner and an insensitive manager. As Clyde recently told Mark Schwartz, his major league dream turned out to be a nightmare. What becomes of a dream when it comes true too soon? Or talent when it is rushed onto the stage? And what was an 18-year-old kid doing in the Texas Rangers starting rotation? Well, David Clyde was no ordinary kid. He could pitch. He could pitch smart. Gene Clyde kept records as his son methodically set them. In his senior year at Houston's Westchester High, David was unhittable. He finished 18 and 0, threw five no hitters and a perfect game. There are games, they say, where people would foul one off and the parents would cheer for the kid that fouled the ball off. Sure, that's only high school, but high school's been played forever, and there's never been a kid like that. In a state that produced Nolan Ryan, Roger Clemens, and Kerry Wood, David Clyde was a Texas-sized legend like no other. If things had gone down the way everybody projected it to be, we might have been talking today, and I don't mean in any way, shape, or form to, to uh, relate myself to Roger Clemens, but who knows, maybe today we're both talking about 300 wins. Roger Clemens wasn't in David Clyde's league when he was 18 years old. David Clyde was so far above Roger Clemens when he was 18 years old that you can't even, it's like comparing apples and oranges. That's true, and if Roger Clemens had started out with the Rangers franchise, you'd be talking about Roger Clemens selling Chevrolets right now, too. Mike Shropshire spent six seasons covering the Rangers during the mid-70s, then chronicled their singular ineptitude and countless vices in his book, Seasons in Hell. A waitress at a restaurant in Boston asked me once, she said, what's with the Rangers? She says, they come in here later than any of the other teams, they drink more coffee, they smoke more cigarettes, and they all order the heaviest thing on the menu. The Rangers did lead the league in oppressive game time temperatures, but little else. Not even cheerleaders in hot pants could get fans excited about a franchise with no tradition and little talent. But cash-strapped owner Bob Short did have a plan. Draft the local kid, put him in the bigs immediately, and create a box office sensation. What did Bob Short see in David Clyde? Dollar signs. The Rangers definitely exploited me. It was probably the worst ball club I could have signed with. For the Rangers, the payoff was immediate. Clyde's big league debut in June of 73 felt more like a Texas-Oklahoma football game than a mid-season date with the Twins. The Rangers sold out Arlington Stadium for the first time ever. And Clyde was not just a headliner. His star power had eclipsed the entire organization. There were huge expectations, 
and the pregame telegram from his idol, Sandy Koufax. I mean, the pressure and the hype was so incredible that it's hard to imagine. I mean, this poor kid is getting dressed for his first start. They have to delay the game by 45 minutes because the cars can't get into the parking lot. Suddenly, he was no longer facing timid teenagers, but future Hall of Famers like Rod Carew. Clyde walked the first two batters he faced, but it was how he recovered that made the night unforgettable. I guess you couldn't script it much better unless I walked the third one, but uh, I struck out the side and uh, the place went wild. Clyde was an instant icon in any language. Over five innings, the kid allowed only one hit, a home run. But despite all the adulation, when it was over, he seemed to suspect the glory might not last. I got away tonight with a lot of pitches that I shouldn't have gotten away with and everything, and maybe the next time around I, I won't be so lucky and everything. Once David got through that first start, now he's got to go to his next start, and then the next one. And I think just the grinding it out on an everyday basis, he came to realize, hey, this is not going to be easy. This is going to be a, a pretty tough job. The next one. And I think just the grinding it out on an everyday basis, he came to realize, hey, this is not going to be easy. This is going to be a, a pretty tough job. For the first time in his baseball life, Clyde began to experience failure. Worse yet, he felt isolated. None of his teammates could relate to a sheltered teenager just weeks removed from his senior prom. Maybe you're talking about the first car that your dad bought you, how proud you were to drive to school. That You can't talk about that with 25 and 30 year olds when you're in the big leagues. They all got, they've all got new cars. They've all got their own kids. They don't want to hear about the prom. They don't even remember their prom. When the season ended, Clyde was a dismal four and eight, but still such an enormous gate attraction, owner Bob Short refused to send him down. Then, Short fired manager Whitey Herzog, replacing him with the volatile Billy Martin, who Clyde still blames for accelerating his slide from phenom to forgotten. He wanted to be the star of the show. He didn't like the young players. He didn't like pitchers. And I had all three of them going against me. He didn't want David in the big leagues. He didn't want him on the team. And I, I think David probably resents that of Billy. And if I were David, I guess I probably would too. But just looking at it objectively, Billy was right. And maybe the owner should have listened to him. Art Fowler, the Rangers pitching coach in 1974, says both he and Martin thought Clyde did not belong in the big leagues. What did Billy Martin think of David Clyde? He just used to tell me he didn't think the guy could pitch. And I agreed with him because I believe Billy. You know, you you take you throw a ball 80, 85 miles an hour, you ain't you ain't throwing the ball hard. And I don't care who said he threw 90, but he, he didn't do it. Is there any way that he didn't throw 90 miles an hour? There's no way. There's no way. I can remember Art sitting back there in spring training, watching David pitch. And he said to me, he says, if this kid will just consistently get the ball over the plate, says if he's not a 25-game winner, I'll eat this batting cage. In 74, Clyde won his first three decisions, only to finish the season three and nine. By early July, Martin had dropped him from the rotation, and according to Clyde, often refused to even let him warm up. The 19-year-old soon lost his curveball his confidence, and perhaps most damaging, his innocence. We had some guys who liked to run the streets at night, and I became, I associated with them, and uh, I take full responsibility for my actions. I never got to the point where drinking was a problem. Uh, I let it get out of hand a couple of times, but it was not to the point where get up in the morning and have a drink, or man, I had to go out tonight and have a drink. Uh, that, was, that was never an issue. Tom Grieve, disagrees. The best example I can give is, is a time in Boston. He'd gone out the night before and the plane is pushing away from the, from the gate and David's not on the plane. And then after about 10 feet it pushes back. David gets on the plane with the same clothes he had on the night before. The kid's 18 years old. By season's end, Clyde was but an afterthought. If you had him in a room right now, what questions would you ask him? Uh, first one would be why. 
what did you have against me that made you so bitter? You know, if I had him in a room, I'd probably be choking him, wanting to know why. By the spring of 75, Clyde was sent down. No longer the franchise, he was mired in the minors, where he now agrees he should have been from the start. Given all the facts, probably. It was the wrong decision to go straight to the big leagues. My own opinion is if they had sent him to the minor leagues in the rookie league and let him work his way up like everybody else, that he would have had a 15-year career in the big leagues, won a couple of hundred ball games, and been a tremendous left-handed pitcher. You don't waste that kind of talent. You don't burn it for a quick buck. Cleveland left-hander David Clyde came out of nowhere to win two ball games, his first big league victories in four years. By age 24, he was out of the big leagues, this time for good. The bonus baby had become a baseball vagabond. At age 26, buried deep in the Astros minor league system, Clyde woke up one morning and decided to quit, just 27 days shy of his major league pension. I just decided that, you know, this isn't what's going to make me happy anymore. Do you feel cheated? No. No. How many people get the opportunity to live their dream? Kind of turned into a little bit of a nightmare, but I had the chance. I missed the game. I'd love to get back into it. I have some selfish reasons. I'm 27 days short of my pension. Sean! McKeever, come on now! Clyde could use that big league pension right about now. Recently unemployed, he spends his evenings helping young players one, whose one, dreams one, one, one. are as big as his once were. For more than 20 Off years, David Clyde has kept his emotional scars well hidden. But a more vulnerable Clyde emerged when he joined his first big league manager for a TV interview. If I ever get a chance to get you those 27 days, I'm going to get them for you. Whitey, I, I loved playing for you. Well, listen, the other thing is... <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, if I, I were you, I, th get... I think the Texas Rangers owe you those 27 days. Whitey touched, touched me pretty good. Excuse me. <laughs> What did he say that surprised you? Or? I guess maybe how he said I was done wrong. That here was a very knowledgeable baseball man, maybe one of the most knowledgeable men in the game, telling me that I wasn't all bad. <laughs> Did you come to think that of yourself? I'd wondered at times. You look at my statistics, they're not impressive. As a professional, they're far from it. But for whatever reason, everybody's got fond memories. Fonder than you have? <laughs> Not really. There's one good moment. Outweighs all the bad. Because like I said, I lived a dream. As I said, it turned into a nightmare, but <laughs> but I did get to live it. And I still live it to this day. It's me. The two men who Clyde and others blamed for many of his problems have both long since died. Rangers owner Bob Short in 1982 and manager Billy Martin in a car crash on Christmas Day 1989. 
Friday night, David Clyde returned to Arlington as the Rangers honored him with a David Clyde night. When we return, we'll be joined by David Clyde 30 years to the week after he made his Major League debut. We'll reflect with him on the anniversary. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome David Clyde. There was no way that I expected to have the same type of success at the major league level that I had at the amateur level. I mean, you're going up against the greatest that have ever played the game. All I hoped to do was go out there and survive. That was the scene Friday at the ballpark in Arlington. It was David Clyde night, and the Rangers honored the man who as an 18-year-old created such enormous excitement. And David Clyde joins us now. David, good morning. Good morning, Jeremy. Thanks for having me. It's, it's our pleasure. Ten years ago, the Rangers honored you with the David Clyde Night. What was it like this time being back in Arlington? Well, it's almost as exciting as it was 30 years ago, outside of the fact of going out there and performing what I love to do 30 years ago, to have the love and emotion that was shown to me Friday night makes all, all of it worthwhile. What does it say that after only seven games winning them for the Rangers and your three seasons with them, that you are still thought of so fondly there? It amazes me, you know. I mean, 17 or 18 and 31 and an ERA around five and uh, to be included in the same crowd with Nolan Ryan and people like that, it's just uh, I can't begin to put into words what, how it makes you feel. David, your fellow Texan, Nolan Ryan, recently said that David Clyde was working for, quote, an owner who looked at him as a cash cow. Billy Martin certainly treated you badly, yet you refused to wallow in self-pity. Why aren't you bitter? What, what do you achieve by, by sitting and being bitter about something that happened 30 years ago? You know, we can't go back and change history. And if, I, if I'm still worried about what happened 30 years ago, uh, I can't take care of the obligations I have today and, and in the future. And as I've said before, I'm one of only 7,500 people in the entire history of really the world that have ever set foot on a major league mound. So win, lose, or draw in that situation, it, it's still something to be awful proud of. You said, David, that your biggest problem was feeling that you never belonged. What do you mean by that? I made this jump from, from high school to the big leagues, and at the same time, I felt like my talent had to make that big a leap. So if I threw 90 miles an hour, I thought I had to throw 100 miles an hour. And if my curveball broke 12 to 14 inches, then I thought it had to break 18 to 24 inches. So instead of sitting there and allowing my natural abilities and the abilities the good Lord gave me to come through, I was actually fighting against myself. David, in the last 30 years, only two pitchers since you have gone straight from high school to the major leagues, both in 1978. Why has it been 25 years since anyone has made the same leap you made? Well, I think in the long run, that's my lifelong contribution to the game in, in, in that every now and then when somebody does come along with the, the abilities or greater abilities than I had, I hear them mention that they're not going to let this happen today as it did to David. And... You know, everybody has to realize that professional sports is a business and that the owners are out to make money. And I guess in, a, in, in one way, that's why I hold no bitterness. But I think nowadays with the amount of money that is involved, the owners and management are real, realizing we're not in it to turn a quick buck, but out for a long-term investment. So do you think it will ever happen again that we'll see a pitcher go straight from high school to major leagues? I think it could quite possibly happen again. I mean, we've seen it in basketball with Kobe Bryant and... Kevin Garnett and we're getting ready to see it again with LeBron James and such so but I think there's a lot of things in place nowadays that weren't in place 30 35 years ago to help mentor a young talent to help them understand that in baseball it is a very long season and that you're going to have peaks and valleys but you, we want to maximize those peaks and minimize the valleys you mentioned that this was your contribution to the game what does it mean to you to be a cautionary tale now I don't think there's an athlete alive that would not love to say that they leave a lasting impression on the game. And I know mine's somewhat negative, but yet, even though I did not succeed on the field the way that I had anticipated doing or many other people had anticipated, still 30 years after the fact, we have a lasting impression on the game. 
David, I think perhaps Jim Reeves put it best in the Star Telegram. He wrote, maybe David Clyde wasn't the savior of the Texas franchise 30 years ago, but he was definitely one of a handful of players who had his hand on the life rope. For that, he paid a precious price, his career. Considering that, what do the Rangers owe you? Rangers owe me absolutely nothing. Um, I have a tremendous passion for the game and would love to get back into the game at any level with the ultimate goal of getting back to the big leagues because whether you're a player or a coach, there's only one place to play and that is in the big leagues. But baseball owes me nothing and all I'm asking for is an opportunity from someone to get back into the game so that I can give back to it what it's given to me. 27 days shy of your major league pension, do you think that's going to happen? Whitey Herzog said he would try for you. Well, I've talked to some people. We've opened some dialogue with the Rangers and uh, the initial dialogue is very positive. Ideally, I'd love to come back with the Rangers and have this story come full cycle, but wherever it may be, whether it be with Detroit or Cleveland or the Yankees or the Dodgers or any ball club, uh, I, I just want to get back into a game that I, that I have a lot of love for, and I think I have a lot of things to offer young pitchers. David, thank you so much for joining us, and congratulations on this bittersweet anniversary. Well, thank you, Jeremy, and I appreciate it. When we were